So, uh, Clara, thank you for joining. Um, the, uh, Clara and I have actually been working together on and off on sort of the go-to-market fit topic for uh, almost a year and a half now. Thanks and, for uh, helping our company. Oh, my pleasure, but frankly, we learned just as much from working with you on this. So, um, one of the things, and I'll ask Claire to introduce herself, a little bit about he or say, where they fit, but the thing that I think is going to be most interesting about this discussion today is that finding go-to-market fit the first time is hard, but if you're going to be successful as a company, you're going to have to do it over and over again a couple times. So building sort of the muscle memory to figure out how to do this and recognize an executive team when you need to do it and do it deliberately, um, I think is part about building a true market-leading, independent, like industry-leading company. You're going to have to do this over and over and over again. And Clara and her team have actually successfully built go-to-market fit once and in their process of trying to do it again. So uh, Clara, could you talk a little bit about, just for introduction purposes, what Hearsay does and uh, how your sales model works and a little bit about this change that's happening? Sure. Um, Hearsay is a fintech SaaS company. Um, I started it with my co-founder eight years ago. And essentially, we power... Um, communications for about 150,000 financial advisors and insurance agents. So everything from texting and social media to their websites to mobile voice calls, we power all the compliance for it and then we gather all the data about what they're doing and use that to help drive productivity. Could you give a sense for sort of size, like how big you guys are? Sure, we have about a couple hundred employees. Okay. Um, so uh, talk a little bit about sort of the sales model you followed historically? And then sort of what's the change you're going through right now? Sure. So we're um, very much sales-led company. We have 600 target accounts, 50 of which matter a lot to us. Um, we actually already work with most banks and insurance companies in North America. Um, and so a lot of it is around landing, landing and expanding with our new product suite. And um, so it's, you know, very, we have no SDRs, actually. We have very highly paid, highly commissioned, um, you know, big enterprise, complex enterprise AEs, and they are supported Remember that by chart? marketing. Way to the left. Yeah, I'm like Compli off the chart. Like yeah. super far to the left. Yeah. So that's us. Um, and it's, you know, it's been interesting, right? Because we started off, the company used to be called Hearsay Social, and we used, um, the, we got our start riding on the coattails of Facebook. So it's an interesting segue. And that allowed us to grow really, really big, really, really fast. We were doubling every year, like you know, two, five, 10, 20, 40 million, like just kept going because we became the de facto partner for Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Whenever they worked with financial services, they needed a compliance partner to be able to, to sell what they sell. And so we, we rode those coattails until um, we started getting cut off. And recently, they've cut off a bunch of, of functionality. But two years ago, actually three years ago now, they, they did the same. And it was a real wake-up call that, OK, we've hitched this ride. Now we have to come up with our own ride. And we always knew there was an inherent risk building on somebody else's platform, especially their data. And so it, it caused us to have to reinvent ourselves. And so while we came up with go-to-market fit that first time, and I thought I could just go be Professor Xavier, um, it's been interesting for me and my team because we've had to, in, in some parts of our company, especially on the go-to-market side, we've had to regress and roll up our sleeves all over again, which frankly has been pretty fun. The, uh, so give us a sense for sort of what's the essence of the change if you look at sort of hearsay go-to-market version one versus hearsay go-to-market version two. And I think what you had mentioned to me was there's something about sort of shifting from product to platform. Could you talk a little bit more about so what's the, what's the essence of the change that you're having to instrument into your go-to-market team? Sure. So the initial product was, it was social selling. It was called Hearsay because we would, an insurance agent or financial advisor would connect their Facebook account to Hearsay, and we would mine their networks or their friends for um, money in motion life events. I'm getting married. I'm getting a divorce. I am just had a kid. I'm moving. I just got a new job. My company's going public. Like all of these financial services specific signals. And it was awesome, right? It was basically lead gen within their own network. 
And based on what we'd help the advisor here, we then help them compliantly say the right thing to the right person at the right time. And that was great, right? Because also, you have to think back to 2010 when we started, um, social media was like really cool. It was kind of like how chatbots are now. Everybody wanted to talk to us. Um, I was invited to present at board meetings and Fortune 50 companies. It was, it was like we had everything, like the wind at our back. And so that was our initial go-to-market motion is we would sell really high, sell them these things, help them generate a bunch of leads, and then the rug got pulled from under us, and the thing that caused these companies to buy from us, we, we no longer had access to, this data. And so we really had to kind of reassess, and, and that's when we talked to, we went back to our customer, and we tried to understand what they were trying to do, and we realized that there was an opportunity for us to um, address their big issue with compliant texting. I mean, even today, most banks and insurance companies tell their advisors that they're not allowed to text their clients, even if their clients text them. And we looked into it. Turns out it's the same exact compliance laws that govern texting as govern social media. We had already built that. It took us five years. It's the kind of thing that you like have to get right, right? Compliance, it's like all or nothing. Mm -hmm. And so we extended it. And so that it, we're really reinventing ourselves as a multi-product company. And then at the same Got time... It. It's that shift to being a multi-product company. It's that Go shift ahead. to being a multi-product company. And then at the same time, what we've realized is, by the way, if you're in this compliance business of capturing, by law, every communication, every call, every text message, every social media interaction, by the way, that's actually really interesting from a data machine learning perspective. Okay, so let's talk about... You mentioned earlier that you had to regress on your sort of go to market fit, go to market playbook, sort of going back from going back to Davy Crockett mode. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit more about that. That's that's actually a really big deal. And like how's that been for you? How's that been for your team? Like how are you actually doing this? Like it's there's really a lot hard. of people who just sort of bounce off that and keep doing what they've been doing and eventually sort of fade into nothing there. So how are you actually making that happen? It's really, really hard. And there have been some pivotal moments in that. Because when we first came up with the new strategy, like after the oh shit moment, we're like, okay, now we're going to do this other thing. And then we all aligned on the strategy. But we kept using the same motions that we had before when we were on fire and we were riding the coattails and all this stuff. So you dropped this new stuff on top of your old go to market fit machinery? Yeah. Got it. And, and that, by that surprise, point, that didn't work. <laughs> and we're like, why are we missing our numbers? <laughs> And it was actually our Ouch. first, I know, it was 2016 was, was very hard for us, for me personally and for everyone in our company. It was our first employee, uh, his name is Chris, that we hired, and he was feeling burned out. He, he had done a number of roles in the company. At this point, he was running Europe, and he's like, Clara, it's just not working. Like, this, it, the strategy sounds right, but it's, it's not working. And so he asked to take some time off, and he did, and he thought about it, and he, and he basically helped me realize that we needed to break apart all of our muscle memory. And Ouch. Yeah. yeah really, which really hurts. And then just completely change the company so that we could execute on the new strategy. And so he came up with this um, framework. We actually came up with our own internal language. I think it's really important. Um, it helps with playbooks mm -hmm. to have... Like, I used to hate acronyms, but it's actually like a, it's, a, it's, a, it's our internal code. And he came up That's with That's a great point. It takes, if you come up with that common lingua franca, that common language, that common framework for everybody to talk about, uh, it seems silly, but it's not. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very, um, it's powerful for team building. And also, it, it's efficient communication. Because when you go to somebody at Hearsay and you say FIFI, they know exactly what you mean. And I won't explain exactly the whole thing to you because it would take a long time. But essentially, it's it's all the things that we learned about the banking and insurance industry and all of the time and motion um, that we observed in these advisors and turning that into our products such that we're no longer a texting product or a social media product. We are an advisor product. We are a wealth management um, technology. But it's, it's, it's been really hard to, like, first he came up with the framework. But now we're, um, there's this tension in our company that we actually talked about at our last executive offsite between the old guard and the new guard. Okay, talk about that. That's interesting. So you got yeah, because the old guard are people like Chris and me who we were we love being Davy Crockett. Like I loved being Joan of Arc, and we're excited to do it again. 
Um, but as a 200-person company, we have to scale. Like, we can't Joan of Arc and Davy Crockett everything. We've got, like, serious people to, like, take care yeah, of. Yeah, you're a multi-10 to million dollar a year company. You can't sort of Davy Crockett. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So, so That's we, kind of schizophrenic, actually. It's schizophrenic. And so before we kind of realized what was happening, there was, there was this conflict where the old guard would be like, oh, these new MBA people, they're really driving me crazy with all their processes and they're so slow and just like GSD, just like break some, like who cares, right? Ask for forgiveness, not permission. And then the new people, not all of them, right? Because some of the new people um, are actually like, like this other crisis, they're also very scrappy. But some of the, some of the new people we brought in, they're like, oh, these old people have got to go. They are so, like, they need to get MBAs. Like, they don't understand how to scale a business and how important process is and repeatability, and we have to move from heroes to systems, blah, 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 blah. And they it really created, has created tension in our org. And, and we talked about this at our executive team offsite a couple of weeks ago, and we just, we discussed how, while we need to get scrappy again in certain areas on this go-to-market learning curve, we have to be very thoughtful about which areas we're doing that on, because it's very costly and fatiguing to the company to Davy Crockett everything. And so we were picking very selectively, like we want to test X or we want to test Y, but all of these other things, the way that we hire, the way that we do benefits and do sales comp, like that's all Professor Xavier and it's people who know what they're doing and are building processes Predictable, repeatable. for scale. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's, it's different. The, uh, how are you managing to live in both worlds? Because you don't get to pick just one or the other, right? Yeah, it's hard. Because I, I like, my favorite is being Joan of Arc. That's my favorite. <laughs> um, and so I skew that way. And I have to really my, discipline. And also, I, I went through a lot of years of executive coaching to not be Davy Crockett or Joan of Arc anymore. And so I unlearned that. But now I have to relearn it sometimes. You're having to unlearn what you unlearned. So I'm actually like schizophrenic. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I'm always second guessing myself. I'm like, am I being Joan of Arc because that's what I love to do or because this situation actually requires it? That's a really powerful observation. Yeah. I could see how that was. A lot of voices in my head, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, all right. So talk about sort of the, the conversations with your management team in terms of refining go to market fit. Like, what are you saying to them? How are they actually like doing this? Like, who's doing what? Because there's a lot of work here. Like, if you had a blank sheet of paper, it's like months and months of work to go fill it in. You've got to redo something that's already there. So how are you actually, what's the execution look like on this? How are you getting your team to do this? So we have, um, it's, it's different. I mean, the frontier of go-to-market, it's sales, marketing, customer success, um, and product. And so the neat thing. All four thing, pillars, yep. All four pillars. The really neat thing is our, prod, our new head of product is actually very entrepreneurial, and so he he knows, and he's getting it done. Our head of engineering started off in, as an IC and grew into the role, so he's like Davey by nature. He's like me, and so he loves it. Um, our head of sales, same thing. He started off as an AE six years ago, and so he also like no, he he loves. Can sorry, go back and forth. Yeah, he, yeah okay. he's going back and forth. He also lo he loves being Braveheart. And then um, we've got um, our head of customer success. He's been with us for a long time, but he's more of a scale person. And so I'm really proud of how he's reinvented himself. And he's, he's really pushed himself and his team. Like, they, it used to be this, like, big, sprawling bureaucracy in customer success. Because you kind of have to, right, when you're scaling. And he's, like, blown up the model and, like, really... I, I don't know, I think inspired all of us to really think That's about great. what customer success actually is at our company. How much time is this for your leadership team to refine go-to-market fit? Like, like if, you know, if they've got a week and they've got to spend their time making stuff happen, but then there's this part of it where, you know, figuring out what the new sales motion looks like, what are you saying and doing, what's the rest of the company to do to support it? Like, there's real work to do here. Like, how, how much time are they spending on this? I don't know. Chris, how much time are you spending? Chris. <laughs> <laughs> So 30% of your time on refining go to market fit? Okay. So this is a really key point. 
that 30% of the leadership's time is being spent on refining good market fit. It would be really easy to follow sort of inertia, muscle memory, what everybody had been doing before. It takes real courage as a leadership team to say, we're going to carve off 30% of our time to go refine good market fit. Like, that's the kind of muscle memory that, like, or kind of attitude and capability, like leadership teams that can sort of reinvent, refine go to market fit multiple times over the life of a company. That's what it takes. Like, it's not something where you'd be like, hey, look, we just need to go develop a new PowerPoint presentation, roll out a new training video. Like, it's fundamentally rewiring the company, and it takes that amount of time. So, it's even harder to rewire than to do it the first time. Because the first yeah, time you have no right. baggage, there's nothing to change. You're yeah. just trying to invent, you're not trying to reinvent. Right. Yeah, I think that's a really powerful point. Because um, now all of a sudden it's not filling on a blank sheet of paper. You've got to get sales, marketing, customer success, and product to all agree to change what they're doing. And there's resistance. But, so there's, talk about that. That's a fascinating point. Talk there about are the people who like, love to execute processes. And like God bless them, right? Because you need them in certain yeah, parts absolutely. of your company. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of scale. Those are the kind of people you need. But those people are the enemy when you're trying to rewire. They are. Your go-to-market playbook. Because they're trying to keep things the same. And they're like, why are you thrashing me? Like, why are you whiplashing my team? It's like, well, because we're not hitting our numbers. So we have to keep like thrashing <laughs> until we do. No, it's, it's not. It's, it's true. And so I think understanding and helping articulate to them Right, this concept of like, there is a time to be Davy, there's a time to be Joan, there's a time to be, I forget, oh, Eisenhower, right? And, Excellent and, use of the metaphors, thank, thank you. Thank you. I was paying attention. And I'm glad you got a woman in there, Joan, Joan of Arc. Um, so it's like, that is really key. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that was my feedback for Bob's book the first time. I'm like, it was. All the we took the feedback. Are, are we, Claire dudes. was part of our beta. Yeah. And she's like, how about some female images? We're like, duh, good point. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs> yeah. We acted upon it. Um, all right, so talk about how the rest of the company is reacting to this. Like, the, you know, as you're sort of refining good market fit and building these playbooks and figuring out, like, how's the rest of the company reacting to this? I think they've been energized. I mean, just, I don't want to go off gut feel, but, like, from our ENPS, like, jumped almost 20 points. Um, That's a big deal. After we rolled this out. I think people, because people knew... Intellectually, the strategy was right, but they were they knew that whatever we were doing wasn't working. And so they feel excited. And, and who doesn't want to be a critical thinker and be writing? Well, not, not I mean, a lot of people don't, but, but a lot of people at our company like being the ones to figure out yep. the answer and write the playbook versus executing the playbook. And it's really awoken our scrappiest, most entrepreneurial, most creative people in the company. Now, at the same time, um, because of the expansion from pro some point solution to platform, we, we've recognized that there's some skill gaps in the company. And so, again, some people have really responded well to it. They're like, great, it's a learning opportunity for me. Let me sign up. And yep. we, we give them tons of, like, the, everyone gets a huge training budget each year to, like, learn whatever they want to learn. They go to con like, but they have to want to do it. And then some people are like, oh, you know, this feels uncomfortable. My, my title hasn't changed, but my role is changing. Like, I want to go somewhere that's more... Um, Better fit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. How has this affected empowerment? You mentioned that to me when we talked earlier. That was a really interesting point. It's, it's been um, a tale of two cities. Because for those who are on the frontier of learning and they're getting out of the building and they're talking to customers and they're involved in these deals, they have never felt more empowered, not since the early days. But for people who don't do that or don't realize that they need to do that, they feel like, oh my God, I'm, I'm being thrashed because all these things are changing and, and why? Why are we changing these things? And so our, my, our job, my job is to let everybody understand um, and this is why we talked about it at our executive offsite, that, hey, we're in a mode, we're back on the Mark Leslie sales learning curve. We're back on the go-to-market learning curve for this new product. And for our old product, we're like, it's same old, and you need to know that when to use what. That, I think that is a really key point and really insightful point that at a company at their kind of scale or like a John, uh, John Lee scale at... ProsperWorks, 
you can have different parts of your company that are at sort of different stages on finding go-to-market fit and different parts of the learning curve. And the damage is when you're not explicit about it and everybody gets confused. But if you're explicit about it and say, the, this part's here, that part's there, it's actually very empowering because everybody has the context to then understand how their world works and why it's different than what's going on over there. Yeah. So, uh, Clara, thank you for being so candid and honest about sort of the challenges of refunding go-to-market fit at your stage. It's something that every company is going to have to go through. So, you know, kudos to you guys for having the courage to dedicate the right amount of time to go make it happen. Um, let's go ahead and open it up to the audience, sort of maybe one, maybe two questions for Clara. Yeah. Uh, that is, you know, the, the sales skills are around, more around listening than they are about doing a repeatable process versus the other side. Uh, have you experienced that? What do you have to say about that? Yeah, um, that's a very good point. So we have done a lot of listening. So what we, we actually, um, so we like most enterprise companies, we have, we are often selling to a different person than who uses our product. And where, the, where we had fallen um, was that, like, I don't know how it happened, but at some point we stopped talking to our end users and we spent all of our time with the corporate buyer. And granted, there are a lot of corporate buyers to engage. We usually, like, no fewer than 12 people have to sign off on our deals. They're big deals. Ouch, 12. Yeah, lots of, like, <laughs> coordination and, like, our, our stages are, like, longer. Um, and, I mean, longest sales cycle ever, six years, but it was worth it, right, because it's a huge deal. It's the biggest deal we've ever done. Um, but what we realized was that in order for us to succeed with the, this newer stuff, we had to go back to the basics. And so I actually told everybody in the company they have to go do a follow-me-home visit with a financial advisor uh, and not just talk to them about our product, but actually just watch them work for you know, two-plus hours just to really build empathy and understand um, so we did a lot of listening there, and then it helps being in a single vertical company because it's not like we have have to like do all this discovery around what are your critical business issues. Like, there's three critical business issues facing every single bank and insurance company, and we kind of we know them. And so we instead of teasing it out, we just say like we talk about the three, and then usually they their body language shifts around one of them, and then that's where we focus. Great. Uh, last question. Okay, great. Oh, go up. Sorry. Can you get the mic over there? One sec, just so everybody can hear. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So my question for you is for the executors when you needed to go into learning mode again, what kind of coaching and timeline did you give them to either change or be changed? Um, <laughs> it's a very precise question. That was great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I would say it's actually in flight. It's in flight right now. Um, we just hired a VP of people. I'm really excited. She's from Netflix, and she's helping us architect a lot of this stuff. We are a very kind fa family. I mean, we're our, fa our, our company is, like, very to a fault. Um, so we we lean on the side of trying to find other roles for people and to like give them everything they want. At the same time, some people don't want it. And so to your point, we have to be very explicit about what's expected of each role. And um, we are like halfway through having all of those conversations. Okay, great. Clara, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let's give Clara a hand. Thank you, Clara. Yeah. This is, this is great.